स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया हेलो एवरीबॉडी वेलकम टू द कोर्स ऑन प्रिसिशन ऑनकोलॉजी सो नेक्स्ट कम्स टारगेटिंग द इम्यून सिस्टम नाउ what are the now the, when we are targeting the immune system one could use the tumor infiltrating t cells or one could use the cars that is the chimeric antigen receptor so now the car uh, uh, is actually a separate topic which needs to be covered in detail but i am just giving a birds eye view of what is being done here so what are the advantages and disadvantages of each strategy of this adoptive cell transfer so the tumor specific t or the nk cells can be derived so they can be derived from the tumor and when they are derived from the tumor they are called as the tumor infiltrating t cells or they can be cultured that is cultured from the naive t cells the cytotoxic t cells or they can be genetically engineered which can recognize a particular tumor specific antigen and that is called as the chimeric antigen receptor t cells so harvest of the tumor infiltrating cells ensure heterogeneous t cells with a very large repertoire however not all tumors will have enough number of tumor infiltrating cells for treatment so therefore it is important to genetically engineer them it is possible for in vitro generation of tumor specific t cells from the peripheral t cells and they can be useful as they can circumvent the limitation of the tumor infiltrating cells so therefore both types of t cells rely on the stable antigen mhc expression so it's very very important to have an antigen mhc expression a tumor antigen which will be used by these t cells so to overcome this the chimeric antigen receptor which is called as the car t cells are designed similarly Uh, similar to car t cells you also have the nk cells these nk cells can also be uh, generated uh, genetically engineered to target the tumor cells but uh, compared to the car t the nk car has not been so successful mainly due to the off tumor toxicity and a shorter life span compared to the cars now come let us Uh, look at a very very important concept which is called as the immune checkpoint blockade this particular slide basically explains the mechanism and it is the very important concept behind the immunotherapy which is being very very successful these days now uh, the tumor cell now this is a tumor cell and this is a t cell now please see that within in the tumor cell there is a particular uh, Uh, a kind of a protein called as the pdl1 which is produced by the tumor cell and this binds to a receptor here which is secreted by the t cells called as the pd1 so the pd1 of the t cells binds to the pdl1 of the tumor cell and here the tumor cell is expressing the tumor specific antigen here and this antigen is recognized by the t cell receptor which is present in the t cell so the pdl1 binds to pd1 and this binding between the pd1 and the pdl1 will will inhibit the uh, killing of this tumor cell by the t cells this binding is preventing this now we will see how to inhibit this binding if there is a way to block this binding in the form of using an anti pdl1 or anti pd1 to block these uh, receptors then what happens is the t cell is able to identify the tumor cell and lead to its destruction so this is the whole concept how we are going to inhibit what we are going to use to inhibit the pdl1 or the pd1 now what happens in an innate immune resistance so you have the tumor cell you have the mhc class 1 and then you have the t cells here you have the t cell receptor the mhc class 1 is presenting the tumor antigen here so which could be a peptide and then this is recognized by the tcr 
it is recognized but still because of the binding of the pdl1 of the tumor cell to pd1 of the t cell this particular pathway is inhibited so therefore the tumor cells is not effectively killed by the t cell despite the recognition here so this is an innate immune resistance now what happens so that uh, in an adaptive immune resistance now again you have the tumor cell here now in this case you have the mhc the peptide identified by the tcr this in turn leads to uh, another uh, cell another dendritic cell here which is again you know this leads to induction of another cell which will in turn uh, you know present this antigen to another t cell and this is because it is helping in in inducing the t cell for a particular pd1 l1 up regulation and here you are having again the pd1 l1 binding to pd1 leading to inhibition so this is an environment of t cell induced there is an uh, uh, some mechanism which has in turn led to the upregulation of the pdl1 which could be because of the uh, interferons or certain cytokines which are released by the t cell now this t cell released cytokine is increasing the amount of stats within the cell and this stats has actually induced the pdl1 and because of the pdl1 being induced this particular immune reaction has failed now let us see this particular cartoon will explain it very very clearly now this is a t cell this is an antigen presenting cell now this antigen presenting cell has got certain receptors the cd80 or the cd86 now this antigen presenting cell is able to sensitize the t cell so it says say hey wake up i found something suspicious so you have the t cell receptor here the antigen is being presented and here the t cell here has got the cd28 the receptor cd28 which interacts with cd86 and therefore this particular uh, you know binding has sensitized the t cell and the t cell is ready to act now so the t cell says okay i will go and check it out so therefore the antigen presenting cells activate the t cells through certain go buttons so that go button here is cd28 now what happens so this is what is explained here so this is an antigen presenting cell this antigen presenting cell has got cd80 or cd86 here which binds to the cd28 so if it is effectively binding to cd28 the immune reaction can happen that is the t cells can identify the tumor cells but another this is also an important uh, part where the antigen has to be presented to the t cell receptor now let us look at this particular cartoon now here we are talking about a stop signal so we saw that cd28 was a go signal to counteract this there is a stop signal that stop signal is called as the ctla4 now here there is an antigen presenting cell it is presenting the antigen to the t cell it says hey wake up i found something suspicious but what happens is this particular t cell uh, has the ctla4 and the ctla4 has now bound to the cd86 when the ctla4 binds to uh, cd86 there is a stop signal which means the t cells are not able to elicit a response the t cell cells i don't know i am not motivated enough to go and check out so the antigen presenting cells regulate the t cells activation through the stop or the go buttons so if cd28 binds then it's a go button if the ctla4 binds then it's a stop button so that is what is explained here so this is an antigen presenting cell you have the cd80 if it is binding to the cd28 it is a go button whereas if it is binding to ctla4 then it is a stop button now let us see how this can be targeted if we are able to get rid of the stop button then the immune reactions can happen then the t cells will be able to recognize the tumor cells and it can elicit an immune response to get rid of the tumor so what is done in a ctla4 blockade is we have a particular molecule a particular antibody which can bind to the ctla4 blocking the ctla4 
So when CTLA4 is blocked, this can in turn bind to the CD28 and this CTLA4 checkpoint blockade covers the stop button. So the T cells now are activated. It says, okay, I'll go and check out. So the CTLA4 checkout block checkpoint blockade means there is an anti there is an anti CTLA4 an antibody which can selectively bind to the CTLA4 leading to the stop signal. The stop signal is blocked and therefore the cells can there is a go button so which means the cells can go and attack the tumor cells. So next after the CTLA4 one needs to understand the PD1 and the PDL1 checkpoint. Now the T cells have the PD1 and the tumor cells have the PDL1. So some of the T cells are able to recognize the cancer cells. But what happens is the cancer cells are able to fight back by using the PDL1 to target the PD1 on the cell. So the, when the PDL1 and PD1 binds, the immune reaction fails. So the reaction stops. This makes the T cells dysfunctional and therefore the cancer cells are have escaped. Now there are several different antibody drugs that target the PD-1 and the PDL one and they are currently approved for use against a number of cancers. Though nivolumab and pembrolizumab are used most often, they are the very common drugs which are used, the nivolumab and the pembrolizumab they, and they are very very prominent in immunotherapy trials now now depending on the stage of the cancer or the cancer type the pd1 and the pdl1 blockade may be used as the first line of treatment and may be implemented only after the other therapies have failed several different antibody drugs targeting the pd1 and the pdl1 are currently approved for use against a number of cancers though nivolumab and pembrolizumab are used most often. Depending on the stage of the cancer or the cancer type, one could use a PD-1 or the PDL one blockade as the first line of treatment or it can be implemented after the other therapies have failed. The PD-1 checkpoint blockade drug is your pembrolizumab. Now pembrolizumab is for the PD-1 checkpoint. And this was the first immunotherapy drug that was approved for any cancer type with high microsatellite instability. This microsatellite instability is a trait that leads to a number of genetic mutations in cancer cells. So if you have a tumor which is a very high amount of MSI, then these people, the, two, the patients with these kind of tumors can be targeted or they are the targets for the pembrolizumab treatment. And this was the first time a cancer drug was approved based on feature of a cancer rather than the location or the origin. So this is dependent upon the feature, dependent upon the type of that uh, cancer, the profile of that cancer than the location or the origin. Now what do you do in a PD-1 checkpoint? In a PD-1 checkpoint, the PD-1 is blocked. So the PD-1 blockade is like a helmet for the T cells. So therefore, despite so therefore, when this PD-1 is blocked, the PDL1 cannot bind to the PD-1. So therefore, this allows the T cells to maintain function and fight the cancer. In PDL1 checkpoint blockade, the PDL1 blockade is like a bubble wrapping the cancer's best weapon. So can you see here? It protects the PD-1 and prevents interaction with the PDL1. So it essentially it blocks it, which will allow the T cells to maintain function and fight cancer. So as you see here, the PD-1 and PDL1, when they are bound, it is a stop signal. Whereas when you have a PD-1 checkpoint, then the PD-1 anti anti PD-1 antibody binds to PD-1, and therefore the cells can the t cells are free to attack the cancer cells in pdl1 you were blocking the anti pdl1 using an anti pdl1 antibody pdl1 is targeted and therefore the cancer cells can be attacked by the t cells this is what is done in the immunotherapy but 
let me also tell you that PD-1 and PDL-1 are not the only uh, you know co-stimulatory uh, molecules which are present. There are multiple co-stimulatory and inhibitory reactions that will regulate the T cell responses. So, these are all uh, the different co-stimulatory molecules which are present in the antigen presenting cells and these are all the molecules which are present on the T cells. So, one can modulate the activity of this by different combinations of antibodies and if we can do that then that will enhance the immunotherapy uh, component in the tum in, in treatment of tumor. So, there are several uh, uh, development of several agents that have uh, that can target the immune checkpoint pathways and many of them are uh, FDA approved now like this uh, CTLA-4 uh, antibody is called as the ipilimumab. So, this is FDA approved. Then uh, you have the PD-1 molecules, PDL-1 molecules. So, these are all the different uh, antibodies and fusion proteins and these are all the targets of those and these are all the different stages of clinical development. So, therefore, there is a lot of exciting trials which are happening in the area of immunotherapy. So, therefore, you can have, now there are several ways in which this is happening. You could have a strong endogenous anti-tumor response, but because of the PD-1, PD-L1 upregulation on the tumor cells or due to the tumor associated macrophages, you know, there cannot, maybe it is not, the, the response is not there. But in, in that case, if, if it is, that is the, if this is, this particular slide I am showing to understand when you should use uh, anti-PD-1 and when you should use both an inducer as well as a PD-1. So, suppose you are already having a good immune, uh, you know, a, an atmosphere within the tumor which can promote a good anti-tumor response. That is presence of enough number of tumor specific antigens and you are also having a PDL1 upregulation on tumors. So, for those tumors, if you can use a single agent PD1, you will be able to get a response. A second scenario where there is a weak endogenous anti tumor response and there is no PDL1 regulation, then again, even you are using a single agent for anti PD1, there will be a response. Whereas, if you are having a situation where there is a weak endogenous anti-tumor response and there is an increased endogenous, endogenous anti-tumor immune response and increased PDL1 expression also, if the tumor cells are expressing increased amount of PDL1, then if you can uh, you know add the anti-PD1 for response. So, therefore, it is important to study the feature of the tumors to identify the targets for anti-PD-1 treatment. Along with this, there are also combination therapies which are in place. So, cytokines are used in combination therapies to inhibit response to anti-cancer monoclonal antibodies targeting the tumor uh, environment. And uh, for example, the clinical applications for cytokines for cancer immunotherapy. So, there are uh, among all the different immunotherapeutic strategies, this application of GMCSF stands out. So, this uh, cytokine, the GMCSF is secreted by the activated T lymphocytes by fibroblasts, by, by endothelial cells, macrophages and erythroid lineages. Now, this GMCSF will stimulate the antigen presentation on the macrophages and dendritic cells and by doing so, this GMCSF stimulates the antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity of anti-cancer antibody. So, GMCSF helps this way. Interestingly, there was an analysis of blood cancer uh, patients treated with GVAX. So, this GVAX is basically a GMCSF vaccine which has shown that a vaccine induced thyroglobin antibodies with associated prolonged survival of cancer patients. There is a phase 3 clinical trial to treat the Ewing sarcoma with the effect of a compound called as Vigil. This Vigil on the progression, so this is basically treated along with Vigil. They have looked at uh, treatment with irinotecan and Temozolomide. So, there is a three components coming together in this particular trial on Ewing sarcoma. So, this what is this Vigil? This Vigil composition consists of patients' autologous tumor cells 
which is transfected with a gene coding for GMCSF and a short hairpin RNA which is targeting furin. So, this vigil has this gene which will code for the GMCSF and that when it is treated together with irinotecan and temozolomide has shown some progress. There are another uh, uh, phase 3 clinical trials. So, one phase 3 clinical trial analyzes the effect of Cipulu cell T, which is basically an autologous cell product that consists of a recombinant fusion protein of prostatic acid phosphatase, which is linked to GMCSF in patients with prostate adenocarcinoma. And then there are more than 754 clinical trials which are happening pertaining to the PD1 and the PDL1 pathway, and there are 175 clinical trials that are focusing on the CTLA4 protein. So, the details of these can be obtained from this particular website. I would urge all the listeners to uh, certainly go through this website to understand this trial. So, this concept of immunotherapy is actually revolutionizing the field of cancer treatment these days. Next, we come to targeting the cancer-associated fibroblasts. Now, CAPs, we call them, uh, are the most abundant cell type in a tumor microenvironment and they have also been explored as a promising target for cancer therapy. Now, one of the contributors of this fibroblast phenotype could be uh, membrane-bound serine protease, which is called as the FAP, that is fibroblast activation protein alpha. This protease was found to be expressed in the tumor stroma but not in the healthy tissues. Therefore, it is making this actually makes it an attractive candidate for targeting the CAPS. However, the phase 1 and phase 2 clinical trials of Sibrotuzumabab, an antibody targeting FAP, did not accomplish good outcome. So, therefore, the block of the enzymic activity of this FAP with small molecular inhibitors also resulted in lower survival rates for the patient. So, therefore, this has not been so successful. But currently, there are three studies which are involving targeting of the FAP and this can be accessed and two of them are using R0687428 one which is an interleukin-2 variant which is targeting FAP. Uh, there is also a phase 2 study in patients with advanced solid tumors with or without metastasis is evaluating the therapeutic ability of a combined therapy with atezolizumab, an anti pdl one antibody along with gemcitabine, vinorelbine and this particular small molecular inhibitor. So, there is a combination of all the three which is being explored in the phase 2 study. A phase 1 study is evaluating the safety, pharmacokinetics and therapeutic activity of uh, R0687428 one as a monotherapy. And also this particular small molecular inhibitor uh, combined with strastuzumab or combined with cetuximab for patients with breast and head and neck cancers. So, this particular small molecule inhibitor in combination is seems to be working to target the FAP. Another phase 1 study is analyzing the effect of redirected FAP specific T cells in a FAP positive malignant pleural mesothelioma. So, therefore, there are a lot of novel drugs which are continuing to emerge to tackle the CAF activity proliferation. For example, conophylline with effect in refractory pancreatic cancers. The other aspect is targeting the exosomes. What are these exosomes? Now, if you see here, the exosomes are nothing but there are 30 to 100 NM vesicles which are synthesized in the endosomal pathway. This happens in both normal and the tumor cells. So, these exosomes are composed by a lipid bilayer and they can carry functional membrane and cytosolic proteins, miRNAs, mRNAs, cytokines, chemokines, growth factors, all these can be carried into these exosomes. The release of exosomes from the normal and diseased cells is affected by multiple factors including calcium ischemia, cellular stress, pH, formal esters and loss of cellular attachment. So, a lot of these things help to release these exosomes. So, the exosomes originate as the uh, 
intraluminal vesicles so ilvs so these ilvs may comprise of proteins uh, macromolecules lipids etc now uh, so through uh, first you have the early endosomes from early endosomes they will mature as late endosomes and from late endosomes they become uh, multi vesicular bodies these multi vesicular bodies when get released from the cell and that is what is your exosomes so these exosomes will comprise of lipids nucleic acid surface protein so this is something uh, this formation of uh, exosomes is a normal phenomenon in both normal as well as in tumor cells now let us see how we can exploit this in treatment these exosomes because contain a lipid bilayer they can be used as a cargo you could load them with small molecules or with genetic substances or with proteins and they can be used for therapeutic application not only for cancer inflammation fibrosis so any kind of therapeutic application can be explored in these exosomes now let us see how clinical application of exosome can happen now these exosomes can be packed with the dna or some metabolites and then they can be used in for drug delivery so if you have drugs packed into them then they can be used for drug delivery they can be used as a cancer vaccine and as well as because they are shedding they are secreted in the blood they can be uh, identified in liquid biopsy a study uh, that investigated a pro possible use of exosomes presenting the hsp70 protein at their membrane for early diagnosis of patients with malignant tumors has been done so another clinical trial has focused on cancer biomarkers so this is a trial number that is recruiting the prostate cancer patients to evaluate the performance of exodx prostate which is called as the intelliscore device which is a non digital liquid biopsy examination based on urine to predict whether the patient requires an invasive biopsy for diagnosis so in the urine one could identify and detect these exosomes which can decide whether an invasive biopsy is necessary similarly another phase two trial is assessing the ct dna in the blood circulating exosomes to evaluate the potential use of nivolumab and ipilimumab for treatment in recurrent stage 4 her2 negative inflammatory breast cancer so one can uh, assess the exosomes in the circulating tumor dna exosomes are also being studied in clinical trials to evaluate their efficacy as vehicles of sirna a phase 1 trial that aims to analyze the maximum tolerated dose there is another clinical trial which is evaluating the possible use of ginger and aloe derived exosomes to reduce the chronic inflammation and insulin resistance in patients with the pcod then there are also combined therapies where you are having an anti pd1 along with an anti vegf anti pd1 with anti vegfr so you can have several combinations here like you are having a pdl1 inhibitor along with an anti vegf as well as a mec inhibitor so these combinations are also being tried in several clinical trials nanomedicines similar to exosomes nanomedicines are also being explored a single nanomaterial that is a nanoparticle can be functionalized with different moieties so one could have moiety which can target tumor cells or you could have recept drugs which can target angiogenesis or caps so uh, you there are several ways in which you could modulate a nanoparticle uh, for and can this can be used for cancer therapeutics and this itself is a separate field of study now coming to models which can help in studying the tumor microenvironment it is important that you know to to understand the effects of drugs these models are you know helping in understanding the tumor microenvironment so this can be done either in the form of a monolayer culture or it can be done as a co culture model along with the cancer associated fibroblasts or it can be done as a 3d culture the cell and the tissue engineered tumor models have been gaining attention since they can recapitulate more closely the tumor microenvironment to which the cells within the tumor are exposed for example if one is doing a study to uh, uh, look at the survival proliferation or gene expression 
heterogeneity which is seen or any concept of multi drug resistance which is being explored with a new drug so these models are coming in very handy it's also important to enable the control of the environmental factors and measurement of cell responses so these models can be used and the of late this 3d systems are coming in becoming very popular so you could have a scaffold free system or a scaffold based system for the type of the 3d systems so you could have a spheroid based cultures or you can have a organoids based culture or you can uh, do a scaffold scaffold in the form of a solid scaffold or a hydrogel so all these are are popular these days so you can have a tumor tissue explant on recently this is a very uh, popular concept these days called as a tumor on a chip where uh, different types of the cells are are cultured within a microfluidic device to understand their activity and you can also have multicellular tumor spheroids so this is the tumor on the chip it's otherwise called as the organ on chip so what is done here is you have the tumor microenvironment and within these uh, wells you are uh, you can actually uh, you know based on the uh, the type of different type of cells can be cultured within the same device so you could have the necrotic core the starved region or the normoxic region so you can have a organ on chip of your choice uh, which can encompass plenty of branches within the cancer field so this organ on chip device is is rapidly in use these days in addition to stimulating the tumor microenvironment and its characteristic uh, uh, regions these this chip can induce or it can recreate the tumor cell migration invasion and metastasic metastasis properties uh, helping us to understand vascularization extravasation and other tumor microenvironment recreations immune oncology studies drug screening related studies all this are currently being explored on this organ on chip model so the fundamental research on understanding the tumor microenvironment is mandatory for developing new models that can allow and validate new therapeutic approaches a microenvironment surrounding the tumors contribute to contributing to their malignant state so it's very very important to understand the tumor ecosystem this tumor microenvironment has an impact on the expressed cell surface receptors it can uh, it has an influence in activated or the silenced signaling pathways and it will definitely influence the therapeutic effect or response so therefore it is very important to understand the tme to address problems such as no response to therapy or tumor resistance or aiming at achieving a personalized medic medicine in oncology one has to study each tumor as a multifactorial disease different in each patient and thus requiring a different strategy regarding the therapeutics especially focused on the different combinations so each tumor environment itself is a multifactorial disease finally the use of nanotechnology can simplify tailored medicine since targeting different targeting molecules can be anchored in a single nanomaterial thank you for your attention